This is the Chicks of Fintwit, a finance podcast by women for everyone. I am your host, Caitlin Cook. Join me as I highlight female trailblazers and their male allies across the industry as each shares their expertise on a variety of finance topics. Nothing is off limits. Thanks for joining us. Now, please enjoy this episode. All opinions expressed by Caitlin Cook and the Chicks of Finchwit podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinions of the host or any of their affiliates. This podcast is for informational purposes only, is not investment advice, and should not be relied upon for any investment decisions. We are not recommending any securities, nor is this an offer or sale of a security. Hello, and welcome to the Chicks of Fintwit podcast, a finance podcast by women for everyone. I'm your host, Caitlin Cook, otherwise known as Dead Kate Bounce on Twitter. And today I am so excited, always excited, but especially excited about this one. We have Kyla Scanlon on the pod. And if you don't know her yet, you should. You probably have seen her on social media, taking Twitter and TikTok by storm. Kyla, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Super excited to be here. Um, So for those of you who somehow have not heard of Kyla yet, I'm sure even in passing, you may have not realizing from all of her awesome content that she's been putting out, but I'm not even sure that I can do her justice on everything that she's been doing. So I guess maybe if you could give a quick introduction on yourself to kind of let people know who you are. Although yeah, I yeah. should know already. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's actually kind of funny. I feel like a lot of people just see me as like this video girl. Um, so I'm super excited to like scratch <laughs> the surface on that. Um, but yeah, so I, uh, I've been in finance for a little bit. I started trading options in high school um, and then went to college and majored in finance, economics and data analytics. And then once I graduated in 2019, I went to work for Cap Group, which is a mutual fund company. Um, and I left them recently and then decided to do a stint in tech. Um, and once I left Cap Group, I uh, complied finance was no longer a super big issue. So I was able to, <laughs> to go back to creating financial content, which I'd been doing in college. Um, so started making TikToks about the market. So I do a daily market update as well as different um, skits, one would say, about the market dynamics uh, and also have a newsletter, a YouTube channel and a podcast. So Kyla, you mentioned trading options in high school, which in itself is insanely cool, but I was definitely not at that point in high school. But where did, I guess, where did the passion for finance and investing come from? That's like a very early age to start all of that. I'm just curious. Yeah, I mean, it was just kind of like, I started a tasty trade. Um, so they, like, I just was like really into money, like the concept of it. And for me, it was never about like making money. I just wanted to understand like what money was because <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm from like a town in Kentucky and it just like never seemed like it made sense. Um, mm-hmm. So I really wanted to like dive deep into money and like getting the idea of like how to make more of it because I felt like if I could understand money, I could like go far. Um, and like, the thing was like, how do I get out of Kentucky? That was like the main thing that I wanted to solve for. And so I figured like, you know, finance would be one way to get out of there. But when I got to, I didn't know, like, fin- <laughs> I didn't even know that finance was something that you could like major in at school. Um, so mm-hmm. I got to college and I was like, engineering makes sense. So I did engineering um, for a little bit. And then I was like, oh, finance <laughs> is a major. Um, so I switched over to finance, econ and data analytics. Um, and all the while in school, I was like writing for Seeking Alpha and like doing my little options trading stuff because the main goal for me was like how do I find other people that like want to talk about this stuff and the only way that I could do that by was like posting online because none of my close friends surprisingly um, (laughs) were into (laughs) trading options so um, posting online became like the de facto for doing that and like it enabled me to you know I think helped get the job at cap group and then sort of like catapulted everything which is like having an online presence yeah yeah well starting young I love it (laughs) <laughs> yeah and do you think do you, I feel like you have almost like a leg up on starting the you know like the monetizing your content it seems like you sort of did that from early on just putting yourself out there mm-hmm. and I, I think another important part with that is I think a lot of the intimidation and in putting content out there comes from you know not necessarily having the personality for it or having it be a little bit scary how did you how did you overcome that at first was that something I'm sure that's probably something that you face as well Oh yeah, I'm an introvert. I'm an INTJ. <laughs> if, if you follow Myers Briggs, like uh, <laughs> INTJs care the most about the whole Myers Briggs thing. I found. I know. I, I, I responded <laughs> to her tweet. Yeah, terminal value. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, no. I think like for me, it was just like 
what what could go wrong like people could make fun of me whatever um but like I need to learn this stuff and the only way that I'm going to learn it is by like talking to people and the only way that I'm going to talk to people is if I go online and start chatting um and so that's what I did I was like I'll write these blog posts and like you know trial and error and people will correct me and in in the seeking alpha comments like people would be like you're wrong you're dumb like all this stuff and I just be like okay like what can I glean from that Mm -hmm. so I've been under I guess like quote unquote the microscope for a long time so I started writing like back when I was um 18 so what is that five years um so I've been like kind of you know picking away at this stuff for a bit but uh yeah you just gotta like like it's it it sucks sometimes but I think it really helps like expedite your learning and build Mm -hmm. community as well yeah that's how we met right like we're both yes (laughs) (laughs) it can do a lot for you and I think I think it is very easy to sort of dwell on the more negative aspects of it and what could go wrong but there's so much to get from it that you're really not, you're really, it's, there's really nothing to lose and everything to gain if you like put the most into it and do things sort of the right way and meet people like we have to. So I think that's, I think that's probably an important point to note. Yeah. 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 And you can just do as much as you're comfortable with, like, you don't have to like make goofy videos like I do. I don't recommend (laughs) that. Um, But yeah, I mean, we love them. So they're great. (laughs) (laughs) They're fun. They're fun. I think, I think they're fun too. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's different types of, there's so many different types of mediums, right? Even if you're a little bit more introverted, you could go sort of the writing route and then you can make videos. If you're a little more outgoing and creative, you can do all kinds of things. So there's a lot of potential regardless of, you know, personality type and whatever you're trying to overcome. Um, I think it's just that starting is the hardest part as with anything else. And, um, you know, once you're sort of in that groove, it's a lot easier to sort of turn out content also hopefully hurdle all of the, you know, negativity that comes to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You just got to keep on plugging along. Yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, people are noisy. Like at the end of the day, people are noisy, but um, as long as you care about it and you feel like you're adding value to the world, like keep on doing it. Yeah. You are literally everywhere. I just signed up on your <laughs> sub stack. Cause I didn't, I, even, I didn't realize before yeah. this podcast, how much that you're doing. It's incredible. So and for everyone out there, I mean, we're going to be kind of debunking some myths on this front, but let it be known, like she may be TikToking, And I think there's a big stereotype around that, which mm-hmm. we kind of want to tackle in this conversation, but she is brilliant. Everything she puts out is incredible. It's very, she's just very, very smart. So I want to emphasize that she, you know, she's bringing the education to the TikTok side of things. And I personally love that because that's where people want to see their content these days. And she makes it really fun and engaging. So really excited to have you on again. And like I said, super excited for this conversation. You and I are both very passionate about this topic. And we're going to be talking about creator economy, which I kind of, you could call it the passion economy. If you haven't heard of it, I, you probably haven't passing. We're seeing more and more of it from a content standpoint on social media, mm-hmm. just businesses, independent content creators, curators, community builders, and they're all just, you know, influencing, you know, you hear that term influencer, but it's people making all different types of media content and more importantly, monetizing that. So I do want to unpack that today specifically because you are an influencer and you are a content creator. So really want to, you know, I hate that saying, pick your brain, but that's exactly what I'm about to do with this. I guess, you know, there's yeah. as a creator in the con- a creator economy, what does it mean to you? I mean, I feel like it's kind of a cookie cutter statement, but you know, it's kind of different to see it through the eyes of someone that's in it. Yeah. It's so funny. Like I never intentionally wanted to be a creator. I just like wanted to create content. Um, and it wasn't until like a few weeks ago when a couple of brands were like reaching out to me and like called me a creator. It's like, Oh, like maybe, maybe I, that's what I am. Um, and then I like got to thinking about it a little bit more and like started to look into tools, like where I could like work with other creators and like was trying to figure out who was investing in the space because I was like, like surely somebody's like building over here um and like a lot of people are building but um I think that the tools are potentially like not being built with creators in mind uh, or like they're not talking to creators but yeah it for me it just means somebody who is out there like creating content trying to make things more accessible more tangible um and in building bridges between like these big concepts especially in finance right like you have creators that uh might be like pumping coins so on the other side of that you have to have some people who are like building stuff that's a little bit more uh, rational. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what I like so much about the content that you've been putting out, right? Because when a lot of people think of creators or influencers, you know, and I'm guilty of this as well, even being active on Twitter and seeing the more like educational side of it, I think of the 15 year old TikTok stars that are living in mansions together and making all these dance videos. And 
I, it's easy to kind of see things through that single lens is almost like a joke, but there's just, yeah. it's, I think that it's huge. And I think that this is the way that the ball is rolling and that it's only going to snowball into something bigger. And that there's so many different ways you can go with it. People are monetizing their passions. It doesn't have mm-hmm. to necessarily be for educational purposes. And I, I think that a lot of people yeah. are very quick to dismiss it, but really there's, there's like infinite possibilities for the way that this whole creator economy could grow. And I, I just think that we need to be taking it a little bit more seriously. I don't think that it's something that'll be going away anytime soon. And you, as I'd like to hear kind of your opinion on this, but we've seen businesses adopting this as well, working with influencers or working with in, individuals. So like yourself, with I know um, Morning Brew and some others that you've been working with to create TikToks as well. So I, you know, we're seeing business adoption of it now as well. Well, if you think about it, like creators are distribution and like, that's what all brands are trying to solve for is like, how do you get more customers? Right. And so if you're able to like tap into a creator's distribution platform, like that's so much easier than like trying to reach them with an ad. Um, So brands that are able to like work with influencers and get in touch with their audience, like that's going to be like the ROI on that is huge, right? (laughs) Because you just have to pay the creator and then you're like tapped into like however many followers that they have on social. Um, Yeah. Yeah, and your fact too for sure because these they have millions of people following them. A lot of these influencers, and it's if you can tap into that, just think of like you said the distribution, the ROI on that is crazy. Yeah, yeah, and to your point about like how we think about, I think like the economy in general, and like it doesn't have to be education. Like I think that's a really good point because you you would know about this like working in crypto space. Like I think crypto is going to enable all of this to like accelerate, right? Like you could, mm-hmm. um, is it a DAO or a DAO? How do you how do you say it? It's a DAO. Yeah, <laughs> a DAO. Like you could set up a DAO, and like all of a sudden, like you're able to monetize your passion or whatever your creations a lot more easily. Um, so I think crypto is going to help accelerate the uh, creator economy for sure. Yeah. And that's a space that I know you've been doing some work in on TikToks and otherwise just on the education side of this. And I'm very stuck on it because that's one of my favorite things to talk about. And that's kind of what I do in my role now at OnRamp is specifically around education. And I, I do really appreciate the, you know, having this audience, building it out, but also using it for good and trying to, you know, help people that are listening to you and kind of putting all of this information that people could see is really mundane and not something that you really want to spend your time on and just something that's fun and more easily digestible. Um, so I do, I do love that specifically in the finance space. I think there's a lot of things that, like you said, you have people pumping different coins and there's just a lot of misinformation. So did you kind of find that it was more easy, like very well received when you started doing this? I feel like you blew up in your audience very, very quickly. And I think that kind of speaks to the demand of this type of content. Yeah, like I think that the issue with like financial content, like financial media in general, like I think some of the big like brands, it's like there's a lot of gatekeeping, right? Like Mm -hmm. they don't make the content accessible and that's on purpose (laughs) because they don't want everybody in the industry. And so I think if you're able to like break down concepts in a way that people can be like, oh, like I know about inflation because like my food's more expensive. Like that's how that's going to impact me. So if you can Mm -hmm. like kind of create these anchors for people in their mind on like what all this stuff means. Like one thing that I do in my daily market updates is if the market was green that day, I say that it was photosynthesizing (laughs) because then people are able to be like, oh, like it's green. Like that's good. Like it's growing right Mm -hmm. and so if you're able to like anchor people to those concepts it's going to be a lot more powerful for them than versus like listening to like a news anchor scream about you know the next stock that you should buy well um kyla you're making all this finance concept er, finance content you're making it more accessible but like we were saying it's so hard to make difficult concepts simple and i think the whole watering things down and making things as simple and basic as possible is very a very underrated skill that very few have and you're wonderful at it but i suppose what what is the hardest finance concept you've you know been creating content around what did you have the most difficulty with yeah so i'm going to i'm going to answer a little bit longer than probably you'd like uh, cuz i have two <laughs> points here so like one um, I think when you simplify content, people tend to conflate that with it being like dumb content. Uh, so I've gotten a couple of comments where like, oh, I thought you were dumb because like the videos are silly. So I think like there's an interesting correlation causation issue going on in people's heads in terms of like how they think about simplified content. Like it's actually super, super hard to like condense a research paper into five bullet points versus like right. writing, like 10 million pages of work. Um, so I think the hardest thing for me I did a YouTube video about RRP 
And that was kind of hard, just like kind of the financial engineering of the Fed and just understanding like why banks did it, like why everybody was interested in RRP, what it meant for like the global financial system. So that was kind of hard. Um, and what else? Like, I think I did a like my very, very first video on crypto. I was using Legos to explain it. And that mm-hmm. one, I was just like, I was just so nervous. I was going to like say something wrong. But I think most of them, you, you can condense down into like a short form video. But RRP was a little bit difficult just because there's so many moving pieces. And it's just like kind of bizarre to, if you, yeah. you think about how it works. Yeah. And I, you've probably learned so much from all of this process oh, yeah. too. Even if you got negative feedback from it, these are things that in any job, there's no way you'd be covering all of these different things. If if so, if that's a possibility, it's not a job I've ever heard of other than a content <laughs> creator because you're yeah. really covering everything. Um, do you find that certain topics are, are harder to simplify, I suppose, even just knowing the audience that you're going to have? Like you mentioned crypto and a lot of people in the space, you know, working in that as well is people are either just getting started or they're diehards that have been doing it for years. And if they're diehards, they will be more than willing to let you know that they are. And they will love to tell you that you're wrong. Do you get a little bit more, more nervous approaching content, like concepts like that, when you know that that's going to be the potential backlash with the audience that's out there? Yeah. Crypto is scary. Like <laughs> crypto people are, can be like pretty mean. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah. And like, oftentimes, like, I don't think that they want jokes made about the content. And like most <laughs> of my content is like a little jokey. Right. Yeah. Um, so like, I always get like, I, I, right now I'm doing crypto videos for morning brew and I like, I did one on the lightning network. I did one on DeFi and I got mm-hmm. some nervous that like, I would just get dragged <laughs> like on, on Twitter. But like, uh, luckily that, that didn't happen. Knock on wood that it doesn't. Um, but yeah, I, I get pretty nervous about that um, in, in making those videos. Yeah. 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 And it, it's definitely one of those more, we were talking damage control. Like yeah. you have to think so far ahead with everything you're putting out and the potential ways that it could be absorbed by others and just like either, either kind of swerve whatever that is or find a way to make sure that it's so like, I guess like buttoned up that there's really no way for people to attack it. But I, I feel like people always find a way on that front. Yeah. Well, like what I try to do is I try to remain as neutral as possible and throw in like positivity, like positive things that I'm talking about, as well as like kind of like memeing it. So like making faces, Mm -hmm. but also like saying things that are factually correct. So I try to stay as far away as I can from my own opinions on the subject, because like it's just not necessary in an explainer video. Um, Yeah. So, yeah, that's like how I hedge against it. But people still think that facts can be opinions sometimes. So (laughs) yeah, there's so many of those. Oh, oh love it. Love to see it. <laughs> just like, that's not true. It's true. And you like link them to a source and they're like, that's incorrect. And it's like, yeah. you can't even argue with it, you know? Uh, it is so hard to, and I think that's another skill we talk about, like simplifying things being such a huge underrated skill, but also mm-hmm. remaining like Switzerland sort of in the middle. Yeah. People have very, it's, and it's even when you're consciously making an effort to do that, it's so hard to like, you have those biases in the back of your head or like preconceived notions that you always have, whether you're thinking about it or not. So do you almost have to do like, think of the content ideas and almost do a screen through them again? You're like, wait, is this truly objective or is this, you know, like kind of having to check yourself on that? Yeah, no, I, I do. Um, and like, <laughs> I definitely have opinions. So <laughs> it's like, I, I do have to like kind of push my own head out of the script sometimes. And like, I'll script everything out and I'll have to like, sometimes I have to refilm because I'll like make a face because I'm very expressive. And <laughs> yep. so I'll like make a face. So I, I just have to be like very mindful because I don't want, like, obviously everybody has their own opinions and I don't want anybody to like not have their opinions respected, right? Like as long mm-hmm. as their opinions are somewhat rational. Um, so yeah, I just try to be as like Switzerland as possible. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, and I think that's the content that benefits people more than yeah. more than anything else. Just it's hard to find. Like even we talk about like financial media and even the sources that are, you know, trusted are mm-hmm. always inherently very biased towards one thing or against something. Mm-hmm. So to have that kind of unique perspective. And I think that's a big part of where like content ind- independent content creators can come in and like lend a big hand is that they aren't necessarily reporting to any one maker that's telling them that they have to present something a certain way. It's the way that you want it presented. And if you want kind of a bigger audience or like to capture more, you'd, get, you'd be putting out content that's more neutral because you're getting people from both sides to listen to the same thing rather than just focusing on one side and getting attacked by the other. So I think that that is another thing that 
you know, this whole creator economy will bring about is more neutral content, hopefully just for people to absorb. So, and it's a better way to learn too, right? Like you're not, you're not absorbing content that's super, super biased towards something. And that's like building your opinion for you. It's giving you both sides and letting the person form that for themselves. Yeah. No. And I think that's really important. Like I'm not, I never, ever give stock advice or anything like that. Never to give investment advice, even though, um, that's a fast way to grow your audience on TikTok. So it's like, you know, it's an intentional decision. Like you have to be neutral. You have to help people. And like, you know, I think it's like, you got to teach a man how to fish. You can't just give them fish. And like, it's the same Mm -hmm. thing with investing. Like if you're just like, buy this stock right now, unless you're your financial advisor, right? Um, like mm-hmm. it's, it's much more helpful for people to understand like the underpinnings of the economy. So like, why, why is the Fed interested in, you know, interest rates? Why are they in charge of that? Like what impact does interest rates have on you as a person? Like, if you understand all those little details, you're, it's like, it's going to, it doesn't matter like how you invest. Like you just have to understand all those details, um, in order for you to like function in society, I think like, it's just so important. And, um, you know, people screaming on TV about like, you know, whatever stock, like pumping Wendy's, like that's not helpful, right? Like you have to build things that are helpful to people and one way to do that is just like neutral content yeah yeah and it's like an uphill battle trying to get people to listen to the things that we see as more basic need to know knowledge because the other stuff is so much flashier so I feel like it is sort of probably difficult to get people to listen more to the actual need to knows instead of like here's this stock and why you should buy it and like the the reason behind it not necessarily being that good but wall street butts people are pumping it up this week like what's the stock of the week and i i do think that it's sort of hard to people have short attention spans right like you mentioned that before and it's hard to reel people in so i you know that's probably a big part of it as well yeah and people oftentimes just want get rich quick stuff so like, I mean, the amount of comments I've gotten under my TikToks, like, oh, like, just tell me what to buy. And like, no, I will never, ever do that, dude. Like, you have to just understand, like, just listen to me talk about monetary policy. Because <laughs> um, like, it's going to help you so much more down the road versus like investing in, you know, whatever stock is going to the moon for a millisecond and then <laughs> your rug is going to get pulled, right? Like, yeah, um, yeah. People don't like to think long term, I found. So no. to try and get them to do that, I think that, I think that people will come around to it, but I mean, these days, especially with like everyone on the in, investing specifically with everything being so flashy and get rich quick that it's probably very difficult to kind of be like, okay, come back down to earth. This is what we need, really need to focus on. And here's why. Yeah. Well, it seems silly too to be like, we have to care about interest <laughs> rates when you've got like stocks going up, like, you know, 2000%, like it's just like, no, we don't. But um, I think I, I'm, I'm hoping some of this behavior will die down a little bit. So then interest rates will matter again. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah. And I think that that's, that's an important thing for actually getting people to truly understand and be engaging in something is comparisons are so powerful. And it, especially if it's to something that you're already familiar with and trying to understand difficult concepts and finance is so easy to get down in the weeds in and not understand it's so much jargon. And it, like you said, it does kind of seem like these firms sort of gatekeep information and they don't want to, I don't know if it's don't necessarily want to make it more easily understandable for like the average person that's not involved. It does sort of seem that way sometimes. So to have someone that's taking the time to kind of break that down, I think it's a net positive for everyone too. If everyone had a better understanding of the financial services space and just finances in general, even like personal finance concepts are so difficult for people to understand. And the reason for that is that a lot of the people creating this content are so deep in that what's simple to them isn't really simple to everyone else. And I think that's something that's overlooked a lot. Like in in my role now, I'm trying to create content for people who have no idea what crypto is. And you basically need to simplify things and then simplify it five times more than you think you needed to originally. So I honestly like kudos to you on your ability to do that because it's, it is so incredibly difficult to make things simple. And I don't think the end users necessarily appreciate that every single time. It's just kind of subconscious thing. Um, and I know before this podcast, we've been talking about with, with your content that you're putting out, you do get a lot of comments on how people aren't necessarily interested in the way that you're putting out that content. Sometimes it's like the, there's a very high demand for this content and people are almost sort of picky. So maybe you can talk about that. I know we weren't recording when we were starting on that. (laughs) 
Yeah, no, I think like 99% of people like, like the content, they're like, this is helpful, or it's funny, mm-hmm. at least like, it, it makes this concept like a little bit more accessible. But then you've got like that 1%. And this is something that I have to work on just as like a person. It's like, <laughs> you know, criticism, feedback, whatever, however you want to call it. Yeah, it's just like, like one person will be like, I don't like it. And I'm like, oh, you're so okay. Like, I like, like, how am I supposed to respond to that? Um, and then you kind of get stuck on that. And you're like, oh, like, you know, whatever, it's fine. Like they don't like it. But, and then, um, so I do like factual videos where I'll just like green screen and then talk about like whatever happened in the market and then I'll do the skits. And somebody left a comment on one of the skits and they were like, I don't like that you do this, but like, you'll have 99 (laughs) other people that are like, I like it. But I think as a creator, it's hard not to like, um, dive deep into that negativity and be like, oh, I have to please everybody, but it's impossible. Um, and that, and that's one of the hard parts about the whole process is you do, you see the comments (laughs) that people. Yeah. It's very, it's, especially as your audience continues to grow, which I, it has like a weed recently. So I've been paying attention, Mm -hmm. but it's, it is very hard. I think to sort of separate that negativity from the more productive comments, because I'm, I too, am also horrible at taking constructive feedback, but a lot of the time on social, it's more just toxicity. And generally Mm -hmm. it's not even necessarily productive. So Mm -hmm. I, I do think that that's something that's, difficult to get over. I kind of, I'm kind of curious if you ever get over that. I can't say that I have, I don't know if you have either, but I'm hoping that it, you know, it's something that you might get used to because people are always going to be that way. It's just easier said than done. Yeah. I was watching Bo Burnham's Inside Out last night. Um, and I like, <laughs> this is so goofy, but I ended up making like a song about people like <laughs> commenting under videos. And I was like, like, you, like, you don't have to leave this comment. And so like, once I kind of detached myself from the commenter, like that helps a lot. And I was like, you know, I shouldn't just feed into that negative cycle because if I just keep on, you know, paying attention to the negativity, if creators just pay attention to the neg- if anybody, you know, just pays attention to the negativity, like you're going to miss all the flowers that are growing amongst the weeds, right? Uh, right. So it's a lot more important to like feed your flowers and, um, you know, clip the weeds when you can and just ignore it. I had to mute a thread on Twitter because people thought I didn't know how to do math. And I was like, come on guys, it's, it's a joke. But like the internet <laughs> will just take things like to the nth degree. So right? seriously, that's the so worst seriously. part. You can't even yeah. put out, you can't even put out jokes. If you start having a bigger audience, people will just cool. immediately jump on you. Yeah. It's, there's so much negativity out there. So it's difficult. Like you said, though, if you, I mean, if we all stopped doing things from those few negative comments that we got, nothing would be accomplished ever. So as hard as it is to, kind of look at that and take it as it is and just detach from that. I think that, I don't know, there's just, there's a lot to unpack there, but mm-hmm. going into something else here, I guess, still on the creator economy, obviously, but I think it is important to talk about meritocracy, the meritocracy of all of this. I do think yeah. it's nice. We talked about, you know, before the pod, we both went to very small universities and not necessarily in finance. Everyone throws around like the oh, did you go to a target school? And Mm -hmm. we both definitely did not do that. I I do really appreciate that the creator economy is, for the most part, what I've noticed at least, that you're as good as the content that you're producing. And I don't think that people necessarily go back to say, oh, let me see your credentials because what you're putting out there is enough to see whether you know what you're talking about, at least on the education side. But you look at, you know, the broader space and like the, it's not just TikTok, but TikTok's a big part of that right now. Um, like no one's really stopping to ask people where they're coming from and what their background is, which is super refreshing coming from like, we're both in the finance space. I started in a traditional role too. And it's just, that was always something hanging over my shoulder and just a constant reminder of not being like that ideal candidate. So I am sure that you've sort of felt that same way during all of this. It's certainly refreshing to see. And I hope that there's more of that. Honestly, I'm sure that you do too, but yeah, it's, it's hard to fight. Like there's really nothing you can do about it after you've made the choice in the school. So just got to have your work speak for you. Well, and also like college is so expensive. Like for me, like I was like, I have to go like, and I, and I really loved my college experience and I was able to grow a lot because like mm-hmm. I had to fight, you know, I had to fight to get into the industry. Um, but I also like was at this school that like supported me because they saw me as like more than just a number. Right. Um, right. And I think like, like it was just frustrating like when I got into the industry so like I pat I got in like um I got in and like I pat you know passed all the tests or whatever and then like people would still be like where'd you go to school and it's like I'm here I'm here now I'm doing the work like why are you asking me this and I think what's really nice about content creation is like nobody really cares because like it's just you like it's your living portfolio online um and like yeah so it's just so powerful to be able to like prove yourself through that method yeah 
Do you think that we'll see a broader adoption of that? This might be wishful thinking, but a trend towards that not mattering quite as much. And I think we've seen it a little bit, but I'm, I'm hoping that this might be a little bit more of a push towards that. I hope so. I think that there's still like tradition is just baked into finance. Um, but I think like in the crypto space, especially like, as you know, like it's just, if you know your stuff, you know your stuff. It doesn't really matter where you went to school because they don't even teach crypto in school. Um, so I think like, I, I hope so because it's just so silly. It, like it reduces, you know, accessibility. It creates barriers that we don't really need. Um, and if you want like the economy and the society to prosper, like why would you just be like, you didn't go to, you know, this Ivy League school, so you don't mm-hmm. deserve to have a seat at the table. So it's so silly. It's so silly. It is. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And I think that it is nice, especially in, you know, we're focusing on finance. We're both in finance. Your content is about finance. I think that this whole trend will make the industry more accessible. I've seen a lot of people creating content for themselves and like starting to work with different companies that you may never have gotten a chance. I don't even want to say have a chance with before, but at some point you might just be brought down to being a number in some of these larger firms for the applications and things. And I think it's making even the biggest, more traditional firms turn their heads, just mm-hmm. seeing, oh, wait, wow, people are really into this whole TikTok thing, or people like seeing videos like this, or people are really engaging with this type of content. Maybe I should take a look. And I think it's opening the door for a lot of people that wouldn't necessarily be considered like first choice from a traditional standpoint. So I'm hoping that that continues because there's so many creative people out there that you shouldn't have to pay $60,000 or that's the same reason that I, I chose my school as well. It's like a money standpoint, like not everyone can afford to have that on their resume. And is it worth it at some point? I, I would argue no, but I also didn't go to one. So I know that people have very strong opinions on that. Mm-hmm. Um, I do hope that we, we sort of see more of a shift towards that and the more traditional parts of the finance space though. Yeah. It, well, and to your point about marketing, I saw this tweet that was like, you know, the past 10 years in the marketing space have been focused just on optimization. So like how many like users can you reach? Like how many numbers can you get? But now mm-hmm. it's going to be focused on creativity. And like you have to like tap into like the creative economy, like the creator economy in order yeah. to like capitalize on that. Um, so I think that's like going to be a huge shift moving forward. It's like it's not about like how many people you can reach because a lot of the times those are inflated metrics. It's going to mm-hmm. be about like how good the content actually is because people have limited attention spans and the, the whole Internet is open to them. Yeah, I mean, it's on this whole shift to digit- digitization that we've like constantly seen. And I think it was perpetuated by everything with COVID, people being stuck at home. So there's more rapid adoption. But back to the, you know, the tapping into the creativity part, you can't teach that with a degree. So I think that just highlights, you know, like you did not learn how to make those TikTok videos that are incredible, that everyone's loving. You did not learn to do that with your degree. You know, I mean, <laughs> there are things that help with that from a content standpoint and what you're talking about. But I do think that 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 creativity part, even within a boring and just I don't want to say finance is necessarily boring because it is very exciting in some respects. Mm-hmm. But I do think that it's breathing some air into an otherwise kind of old, more traditional space. Yeah. No, and that's the goal, right? Like, how do you kind of disrupt the way that we think about like financial education and financial media? And one way to do that is like, like right now, like we have the meme economy too. So everything is being <laughs> memeified. So like, how do you play into that? Like, how do you make finance yeah. like a meme? And, that, and that's what the videos do because that's disruptive, right? Like they're like, whoa, you're not supposed to do that. And like, and the more that you can do things that you're not supposed to, like the more change that you can enact down the road. Yeah. And that's going to be better for the industry as a whole and making it more accessible, which is just so important, even regardless of what you're doing. That's why I'm so passionate about like the financial education aspect, because regardless of what you're doing with your life, that is something that impacts every single person on this planet, regardless of where you are, what you're doing. And it's to make that more, make it a little bit more casual through media and different types of content and making it more easy to understand is better for everyone. Um, I am curious, though, you mentioned memes, <laughs> and I feel like everyone's talking about that right now, but I have seen that you've put that in some of your content as well. I sort of a tangent from the creator economy discussion, but do you think that that has played a big role in getting more people interested in finance, too? Because even if it seems like a joke, I think that it's ramping up the discussions that people are having and making it a little bit more entertaining to follow. 
Yeah, no, I, I wrote this piece a while back, like the importance of memes in terms of like short form content, like, d- d- you know, delivering narratives, because like the main way that we got through COVID was like through memeing it, I think, <laughs> like we, that yeah. was the only way. And, the, and that also like helps people, it transmits a lot of information in a short amount of time. And if you're able to understand like the, the components of the meme, so like the guy pointing at a butterfly, like, you know what that means, right? Or like <laughs> yeah. the guy standing at a party. So like, you have all those concepts on all those context clues within the meme that are going to enable you to like understand whatever it's referring to in finance a little bit better so it's like anchoring people once again yeah the memes have been so good this past year I (laughs) that is the one thing I know you're not supposed to say that COVID was was good in a lot of ways (laughs) but it was from a content standpoint the past year has been unbelievable (laughs) I don't know if it's ever been topped like I don't know if I'm just like recency bias but it's just all been so good and I feel like every day there's been something new and there's so many people just sitting at home with nothing else to do that the content has just been unbelievably good. Yeah. I think we all had to like deeply reflect on ourselves as human <laughs> beings and that like broke us all a little bit. Um, so it's just like a ton of chaotic energy being released into the world. Yeah. Right now. Yeah, yeah. The create the creativity is really flowing now. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. So do you think that I, this could be meme stocks as well, or like just like the whole meme activity and everything. But when we look back on the creator economy and everything like that, I know we've talked about, you know, I think we're going to see further adoption of it. Do you think that it is in a way a bubble? I feel like the amount of content, I don't know if it's mm. sustainable. I So I guess that would be a good question to ask as well. Well, I mean, I guess you could say the same thing about like Netflix and Hulu and all that stuff. Like, is like, are there too many streaming services? Probably. Mm-hmm. But like, there's always going to be like a small corner of the internet that appreciates the content that you're, that well, hypothetically, that the person would be producing. So I think as long as like you have an audience, um, it's not going to be a bubble because it's not like you can, like you can be saturated with content, but like right now there, there's free choice on the internet. So you choose what you're going to watch, you choose what you're going to read. And so I don't think it's a bubble in that regard. I just think it's like how many eyeballs want to pay attention to you versus somebody else. Right. You know? Yeah. And I, like you said, I mean, if there's going to be an audience out there, I suppose people might, your content specifically might not be in favor, but that doesn't mean that the attention's not being drawn somewhere else. Mm-hmm. So it's probably just kind of a, who, who's like the, the hottest ones to follow or like who's producing the best content. I don't know if it, yeah, I feel like that's something that could probably stand the test of time. Yeah. And like with the best content, I wonder about that sometimes. Cause I got into like a conversation with somebody on Twitter this morning about like the meme accounts. So like, like um, Greg and like John Rich <laughs> and like, uh, yeah. like all of those guys and like, they have huge audiences. Is their content good? I don't know. So like, what does that mean in terms of like how you, are they creators? Like, like, I think there's so many unanswered questions in terms of like how we think about content and how we think about divvying up our time. Cause hypothetically, like the best would rise to the top, but I think sometimes it's more so like whatever grabs people's attention will rise mm-hmm. to the top. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that does kind of reflect with, you know, I'm on Twitter a lot, you're on there as well, but there's <sighs> so many very underrated accounts that have mm-hmm. very small followings and everything that they're putting out is just like, insanely good good content right but they just don't have the eyes on it and then you see this whole other section of the space where it's like these fake accounts no one knows who they are they're just putting out jokes all day and I think that we needed that comedic relief especially in the past year but it is there's not necessarily always a quality check and the ones that are putting out the highest quality content aren't necessarily you know I said before it's a meritocracy and in a way that it, it is but it doesn't always make sense when you're looking back and seeing the audiences that you know, some have been able to develop and then the others that, you know, are still consistently, I would say outdoing those people, but still just don't have the eyes on them. Oh yeah. Like the, the amount of stuff that I learn on Twitter is like insane. Like I, mm-hmm. I learn a ton about finance, a ton about investing, a ton about like the macro economy on Twitter, but then you have to like filter out for all like that negative or that other stuff. I don't know if it's negative, but yeah, I mean, and they're all like critically underfollowed and it's just, it's just strange. Like I'm trying to, I've been trying to like parse through it in my head all day. Like why? Um, but I still don't have an answer. Yeah. I wish I knew because it, it is kind of a shame, but I think there's a lot of, there's so many bright people on there that it's almost like too highly saturated with them. Right. Like they can't yeah. all have, I, I guess this could be a good question too, but can they all have that mass following? Or do you think that that's kind of reserved for like that very small group at the top and that the rest are just a little bit like always going to be chronically like underfollowed. I just don't know if the, like the 
the public necessarily follows that as closely and is, you know, I think a lot of people are kind of going unnoticed. No, yeah, I totally agree. And I I guess it's just like market demand, right? Like people kind of want the, the meme. I mean, I don't even want to call it beans because I don't think that's what they do. It's like something different. Like it really- Like parody it, accounts. It's just yeah. jokes all yeah, day. <laughs> it's like not funny stuff. It's like stuff that you would hear in like the fifth grade. And it's like, I guess- maybe there's like some sort of nostalgia that has arisen because of COVID, but it's just like so bizarre. Like I look at these accounts and like, I, I just don't get it. But then you look at the other like accounts that are actually like generating like alpha probably. Um, yeah. And it's just like, why, why not pay attention to this? But I think people, it's like probably a form of escapism too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I definitely have used some of those to, you, you need a laugh and it might not even necessarily be that good, but you're like, okay, that brightened my day up a bit. And I think that pr- might be the appeal of those more silly ones. And people might be more willing to follow something like that, where it's not going to be such dense content. Yeah. It's always just keeping it light. So I do think there's definitely demand for that. And you've seen it with some of these random accounts that are popping up, having like 200,000 followers, which is insane. That's a yeah. massive audience. And it's interesting because it's coming from content like that. That seems very light and not really of substance to actually kind of help people, which I mean, that goes just back to how different people view social and the different ways that you can use it. I do think I I'm more favorable towards the educational side of things, but a lot of people don't see it that way. Yeah. Um, so there, and there's always going to be a market for that. Um, but I am curious on sort of the monetization part of being a content creator as one yourself. Like I am curious what your experience with that has been. And I, again, you're going back to like these 15 year old TikTokers that are living in sharing mansions with their friends that are making like millions of dollars a year. And it, it's just crazy to see that there's a lot of money in that space to be made. And I think that that's only going to continue to grow. So what's your experience been so far with monetizing all the content you've put out? Yeah, there was a tweet from from somebody that was like um, saying that creators don't know like how undercut they are. Um, and Hank Green, like this, this wasn't related to the tweet, but Hank Green released this video on, and he's like an OG creator, right? Like he mm-hmm. was a YouTube. Um, he did this video on TikTok that was talking about like how TikTok doesn't really distribute money to creators and like you know the powers and the hands of the platforms all the time. And so I think creators know that they're being undercut, but like none of us. I'm including myself in that. Like none of us know how to price our stuff. There's like not a framework. Like you can't go on Glassdoor and be like, oh, this creator is getting paid this. You can only have like backdoor conversations. And once you have those backdoor conversations and you realize that you've been undercut like a hundred percent versus somebody else in your space, it feels really bad. And there's like no... um, like there's no way that you can like address that with, with the company, with the brand, um, because it's like super hard to negotiate because like you, it's just you, it's just you. And they've got like a whole team um, and they have like a finance team, they have an accounting team, they have a legal team. Um, and so I think like it, there's just so much hands and like the platforms and the brands that they can put this pressure on creators and creators don't know how to value themselves. It's not that they don't know that they're being undercut. They definitely do. Um, but they don't know how to have like those conversations about monetization. Nobody teaches you that. You just are thrown right. into the mix. And then you've got to like do all these like um, tax forms with all these different companies and your social security numbers just flying around out there. And there's nobody like addressing that. Like it's just so bizarre. Like everybody's building like these platforms like that are supposed to help creators, but nobody's thinking about like the, you know, m- creator mental health number one. And, well, mm-hmm. I'm sure somebody is out there, but creator mental health and then also monetization at large scale, yeah. right? Yeah. And I think someone should teach a masterclass and it it goes into a bunch of different things because one, how do you put a price on the creativity? Because Mm -hmm. that's really what all of this is going back to. Mm -hmm. It's not the data and numbers that you can crunch and like, oh, I did a valuation on myself. This is what I'm worth. (laughs) This is what I'm worth for piece of content that you can't really, you can do that, but it's so subjective that it's like, I don't really, I feel like whoever cracks the code on that and figures out the best way to kind of go about the monetization process and talking creators through, this is how you figure out what you're worth. This is, I mean, like you said, they probably know that they're being underpaid and like, you know, that you're being underpaid by a lot of people, but I I think there needs to be a way to sort of streamline the pricing on that. And I don't know if that'll ever happen just from the different types of content that you see being put out. How do you put those all in one basket and kind of make it a little bit more of an actual business model and pricing model? Um, it just seems it's too fluid almost to put a price on it. So someone should, if anyone's listening to this and they figure out how to kind of 
monetize and help creators with that process and make it a little more smooth. I think that'd be extremely helpful and kind of a breakthrough, but also yeah. it's, it's interesting too, because some of that comes back to, and this is goes so far beyond just like creators, but just knowing your worth and what you're putting out, people are always so afraid to ask for more. Um, especially being a, like a woman too. I've seen studies where it's like women have a more difficult time asking for more too. So I don't know. And, you know, we don't like to necessarily always focus on this, but as a female creator, I guess, have you noticed any distinct, I mean, I'm sure you have like these creator communities and different people that you've talked to putting out content. Is there a difference, a distinct difference in the kind of experience you've had, especially on the monetization side of it so far? Yeah. Um, <laughs> that was like a weird little laugh that I let out. Yeah. I just like, I found out about this last week and I was like, like, I, I don't think companies know that creators like talk to each other. And if you're mm-hmm. going to price us like wildly different, like we're going to find out about it. Um, mm-hmm. And like, yeah. So it was just, a, I, I had a conversation with a couple of other people and it was like, well, how much are, you know, like, what are you looking at your products as? And like, obviously you have to consider audience engagement, like all that stuff. And like, you know, they could be at a totally different level than you. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was like, like two different worlds that we were living in. Um, and I was just like, oh, <laughs> that hurt my feelings. And yeah. then it's like, well, like, what do you even go do? Um, like, what do you do? Yeah. So um Mm -hmm. it's it's tough and like yeah and asking kind of negotiating because you don't feel like like imposter syndrome is definitely a real thing and also like um the power that the you know quote-unquote brand might have over you um because it's just like it's a contract right like there's no nothing beyond that uh that's always scary too so yeah it's it's everything kind of plays against the creator not to like paint a very pessimist I think it's great to be a creator but like um I do think that there is um, a lot of stuff that needs to be worked out in terms of like the, the power dynamics yeah and I think you also mentioned mental health which I wasn't even yeah. shame on me for not really thinking of that in this conversation but I do think that you always have a lens on you and something that's that public right because you're getting mm-hmm. your audience and monetizing all by putting yourself out there which mm-hmm. I think has you know, it's brutal out there. So it's, it's very hard to probably keep that mental health at, you know, like a suitable level. And I'm sure that's something that people kind of wouldn't recognize because you keep that behind the curtain, so to speak, most of the time for everything you're putting out. But have you found that to be super challenging? I know we talked about like the negative comments that you get back and as your audience grows, right. That only, what are you on Twitter? Like 40,000 followers or something. Your TikTok is probably way more than that. I don't have TikTok, but uh, (laughs) it's probably just something that gets worse and worse. Yeah. I mean, it's just kind of like, like I I'll have me personally and like other creators I talk to, like, we'll just have these moments where it's like, Oh my gosh, like what's even happening? Like what's going on? Um, And you know, you'll have like comments that are weird. Um, Like one guy was like, I'm going to stalk you. And it's like, how do you deal with that? Um, And then like, if people are being mean or um, yeah, it's just like, and then you, you are always on, um, and I'm not this, none of this is complaining. Like I'm a, you know, a newbie in this, in this space, but this is just what I've noticed so far is like, you always have to be on, you always have to be thinking about the next like idea, the next thing. And you always have to be thinking about like what people are going to think and kind of operating in that space where you're like, what are, what are other people going to interpret from how I say this? Or what are they going to, you know, draw from how I analyze this? Um, what are like, how can I like appease to the people? It's just like, it's super weird. It's not like a, a bad thing, but it's just kind of like, um, you kind of end up putting yourself last. Yeah. It's kind of like a backwards way of thinking, but it's something you need to do, right? Because you're thinking about the end user, like people that are taking in your content first, right. And then you're building the content and you're thinking about, it's it's just a lot of being proactive on, it's kind of um, like a damage control before you even put the content out too. Right. And I think that there's probably, there's so much demand that I think there's probably a lot of pressure to perform at a high level consistently. And that takes such a toll, like regardless of it's creating content or being an athlete or anything, it's just, Mm. it really weighs on you. And it, it's definitely something that never goes away. So it's like, have a, have a good support system and find a way to cope with it in the best way possible. And, but you just have to keep carrying on, which isn't ideal, but there's really no getting around it. Yeah, no, I mean, like, 
a couple, like on my most recent video, everybody was being really nice, but they were like, oh, this is your best yet. I was like, what if it's my best ever? You know, like your brain just kind of like attaches onto those things and it like starts spinning out and you're like, wow, this is super scary. And like, I know other um, creators struggle with that too. Like, how do you one up yourself continually? Yeah, it's, and all of your content's been great too. And it just depends on, I don't know, it could be off one day and people might be like, wow, okay, maybe she, maybe she wasn't that good. I was wrong. Or yeah. you, you take a long time trying to figure out what's next. And you're like, they're like, oh, well, where is she? Is she done? I guess we're like not really expecting anything from her anymore. So it's, yeah. it's a lot. And putting yourself in any sort of public setting, you're going to get a ton of that pushback. It's just like, I don't know if you have any best practices on coping with that, or I know you're kind of newer on this and it blew up very quickly, but they're almost, I'm, I'm like spitting out business ideas now, but someone needs to come up with almost like a sort of support network way of people like for creators to deal with this. Cause I think a lot of times it's something blows up unexpectedly and then it's off to the races and people aren't mentally prepared for everything that that entails. Everyone thinks that they want that big audience and that they want to kind of be, I don't, not necessarily like be famous, but there's so many negative, not to complain on everything, but there's a lot of negative things that come with that, that you probably don't think of just because a lot of the time, specifically on like the creator side, it goes very quickly. It's not like a planned, Oh, I'm going to start putting out a piece of content every week and I will slowly get to this. It's like, you have one piece that's piece of content. That's great. And it blows up. And all of a sudden everyone's down your throat about everything you've ever put out. So anyone listening to this again, mental health side and planning on for creators and influencers. And I think that's something that's also in high demand. Yeah. Well, um, I'm actually working on a product like around all that stuff. Um, so hopefully like <laughs> if somebody is interested, please reach out. Cause I may have a couple of demos that I've been working through. Uh, we'll have to so, talk offline. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, it'll, it'll it, like, it's just like such an underserved space. And I think like one thing that's frustrating is like, and maybe this is just like my skew view, but like, it seems like the people who are like building in this space, like don't quite get it because it's hard to understand. Right. Like, and I'm obviously like, this sounds like nobody understands me, but it's just like, um, you have to like be so conscientious of like what you're producing and how you're producing it. Um, because they're people at the end of the day. Right. Yeah. And I think that's an awesome business model idea too, because it's just for creators by creators. And it's such a unique experience that I don't think everyone would have, not that I can really talk, but not that anyone has a full grasp on it yet. Just with, it's like with, I I keep going back on crypto and everything. Right. But trying to build in that space as well, it's, it's your, it's an uphill battle for sure, just because it's something that so many people don't understand. And there's a lot of intricacies to it that unless you're specifically have been in that space for a while, it's kind of difficult to build to it without having that full understanding. So I, I think that's something that's, definitely in need on the like creator economy side too. Just a lot of people probably don't understand the ins and outs and the difficulties from within unless they've done it. And it's such a high growth new, like quote unquote new, it's been, you know, years. It's not like this last week or something, but it's when something's that high growth, there's a lot of catching up to do on understanding um, from the back end. right now. I think it's more people just starting to sort of absorb it as a user and not really thinking quite as much on like the back end. Like you said, people are people and Mm -hmm they, you know, deserve actual good resources to be successful and not necessarily just be thrown into the mix and expected to swim. Um, but yeah, lots to work, work on there. Um, (laughs) I think we're, I think we're kind of coming up on time here, but I, I guess multiple things, first of all, any closing thoughts, anything that you think people need to know most importantly on the creator economy, where you see it going. I know that's sort of a loaded question. And then lastly, where can people find you for all of your content that we've talked about for the last 40 minutes or so? Sure. Yeah. I mean, so like, I'm personally pretty excited about the creator economy because I think like, I think we're, we're the same age, right? Like you're 23. Yep. Yeah. So I think like this next generation is not going to want to do like corporate life. Um, it's not interesting. <laughs> That's a fact. <laughs> yeah. And so like, where does the, the creator economy has to become a thing, right? Like in, yeah. in order to capitalize on that. Um, so I think that you're going to see like uh, people developing their own like businesses, whether that be in like the crypto space or the, the entertainment space, but also like, I think there's going to be sort of the decentralization of the corporation and sort of that 
um, you know, not as much middle management. And so what do those people go do? Like they probably have to like lean into the creator economy too. So I think that we're just going to see like, hopefully this explosion, like a renaissance almost like an explosion in creativity. Um, and that's going to be like through the metaverse. So like companies like Roblox are building towards it. Um, but also in the crypto space as well. So I'm, I'm just super excited. I think that um, once we start getting tools that are built for creators, like it's just going to be like a, just a, a ball rolling down a hill. Um, yeah. So yeah, super, super stoked about it. Uh-huh. Yeah. There's so much to unpack too. I feel like we could talk about this for hours and still not get through everything. So first of all, thank you so much for taking the time for this. I have wanted to talk to you since I was on the morning brew club, like event with you talking oh, yeah. about like, this girl. This girl is so smart. I just need to talk to her about this. And you mentioned creator economy and it's, it's just so up and coming and very underrated. I don't think people see from a business standpoint, the many ways that this could go. So it's not going anywhere. It's going to be absolutely huge. I'm really excited to kind of see specifically what you're going to be building in it because I've loved what you've put out so far. And I think it's helped a lot of people. So thank you again for, you know, lending your time and talking to me here. Where can people follow you for all of your your content? I know you're probably on a bunch of different platforms. <laughs> yeah, I'm on like way too many. I'm very <laughs> online. Um, so I have my own Substack, so Kyla.substack.com. I'm on YouTube as Kyla Scanlon. Um, I'm on Twitter as Kyla Scan, and then I'm on Instagram, uh, TikTok as Kai.now. Um, and then I am on Spotify. I'm like trying the podcast game um, a little bit, but we'll see how that how that goes. Um, I think that's everything. Yeah, if you, I, I'm mainly on Twitter. <laughs> so just get Kyla Scan on Twitter. It's probably the best awesome. way to reach me. Yeah. yeah, well, everyone listening, if you're not following her yet, you should. Really big things. And she's she's doing a lot for, I, I think, for the space and for adoption of that. So thank you for all of what you're doing. And thank you again for listening. Thank you to everyone at home or wherever you are, hopefully getting outside, listening to these, this podcast right now. And we will be back next week with another episode. Get outside. Get outside. <laughs> Thank you. You know, me. I had to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Got a plug. Yeah, I hear you. <laughs>